Good morning, Bayside. Everyone surviving out there with this heat? Barely? Yes. Anyone have a broken air conditioner? Raise your hand. Good. Good. We'll keep praying for that. That's awesome. Would you stand up this morning as we worship our God? the clapping is right at the end, but I heard it. You guys, we're on it. <clears throat> this next song just talking about 10,000 reasons, and it's called Bless the Lord. Let's sing this together. Bless the 
guys sound great. Would you turn to someone and just uh, welcome them to church this morning? Introduce yourself if you don't know them. Good morning, Bayside. Welcome to worship this morning. In case you didn't notice, things are looking a little strange around here this morning. Something special is going on. We're going to get to that in a minute. But before we get there, if you're new with us this morning, we would love to get you a little bit more information about our church. There's a contact card, information card in the chair in front of you. If you would like more information about our church, who we are, some of the things we've got going on, just fill that out, put it in the offering bucket as it goes by. No strings attached. We're not coming after you. We just like to share with you what God's doing here at Bayside, and he's doing some pretty amazing things not the least of which is coming up this week. Again, we'll get to that in a minute. 
So if you could fill those contact cards out, there's also a place on there for prayer requests. We love to pray for our people, and we love to pray for each other. We have an amazing prayer team. You can put that on that contact card, and we will pray for you. You'll have about at least 20 people on our contact, on our prayer team, praying for you, and that's a pretty amazing thing. There's something powerful about concerted prayer. And we pray for each other even when there's not a specific request. We just continue to pray for our church and just to seek God for his will and his direction and what he wants for us as a church. Just a few things to share with you. We have a unique opportunity coming up. I'm going to kind of go way forward and work our way backward here on the announcements this morning. But we have a unique opportunity, something we've never done before. On July 14th, we are going to start what we're calling a minors class. And that is not M-I-N-O-R, that is an M-I-N-E-R. Minors as in digging deep, digging deeper into God's word. We come and we come on, on Sunday morning and we worship and, and we hear God's word, but this is an opportunity to dig deeper, to go beyond where we're going on Sunday morning with our sermon series. And just to dig into uh, God's word on a deeper level and on a more intimate level for you, it's going to be in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Mark Christensen is going to be leading that class. It's going to be right after the service. It's going to be two times a month. It's going to be on the second and fourth Sundays of every month. And it's going to be like from 1030 to 1130. And we'll probably meet in one of these classrooms. The place is yet to be determined. If you are interested in digging deeper into God's word and building a deeper and more intimate relationship with him. This is an opportunity for you to do that. There's a sign-up sheet back there on that back table with a little flyer back there and explains a little bit more about the class. Stop by, check it out, sign up if you're interested or talk to myself or Mark. If you just want more information about it, grab one of those information sheets and it will pretty much explain where we're going with that. So that's exciting because it's something we always endeavor here. Teach deep. That's one of our core values, and this is an opportunity for us to do that. Gentlemen, we were going to finish up our series and do a wrap-up tonight. Needless to say, there's a whole lot going on around here, so we are postponing that for a couple weeks until July 7th. Now, on July 7th, not only will it be a wrap-up of where we've been, but it's going to be a kickoff of a new series that we're going to be doing as a men's group and talking a little bit more about that and planning that. So that's going to be on July 7th. Stay tuned for more information. It'll be on Sunday evening afternoon five o'clock potluck um, just bring a side salad or dessert because the main dish is going to be a fish fry by some of our fishermen our local fishermen here in the church and franks fish and franks doesn't get any better than that so plan to be part of that all right next thing coming up it is fireworks time i don't know about you guys but i'm already hearing fireworks going off in our neighborhood and it's still like you know two weeks away but here we go it's fireworks booth time we have a sign up in the back we need help. We still need help. I think we're pretty good, kind of like towards the third and the fourth. But before that, especially in the mornings, if you can help, we desperately need some help in the fireworks booth. This is an opportunity for us to not only to uh, raise money for our church that we are able to do some of the projects that is not uh, fundable by our normal budget, but do some of the things like this. Does the air conditioner feel good this morning? That was one of the projects from our fireworks booth fund, and it's amazing, but it allows us to do some of those things. But not only that, it allows us to reach into our community. We have had people come to our church who got a little card, a little flyer in their, in their bag of fireworks that just introduced our church and told them about our church. So it's a good opportunity for that as well. Be part of that. It's fun. You come, you hang out, you get to meet somebody else that maybe you've never known before, get to know them a little bit. And when you serve and when you work together, there's just something awesome that happens when you do that together. And then finally, in case you hadn't noticed, it looks like a jungle. What is going on? We have, starting tomorrow, the moment you've all been waiting for, breakaway. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to have Miss Bethany, our children's director. Would you give Bethany a very warm welcome this morning? I cannot tell you how much effort goes into this by the folks who are putting this together. Bethany, her staff, Kelly, Jen, all the people that are Nate that are doing all this. It's a lot of work. But it it's is. a lot of fun. It is Tell so us about much fun. It. I'm so excited. Okay, if you're here and you are helping at Breakaway this week, can you just raise your hand? All right. These are the brave ones that came the week before and are not sleeping. Uh -huh, exactly. I think a lot of people are sleeping. 
Um, thank you everyone who's signed up to help. We are so excited for Breakaway this year. Um, I don't know about you, but our kids, like, they need this so much. Um, I have so many parents from the community just saying, I can't wait for breakaway. My kids can't wait for breakaway. The parents can't wait for five days of a break from their kids for breakaway. I've heard it all. So thank you for being part of it. If you are a volunteer, if you want a t-shirt, your t-shirt would be blue. Um, go see Jen in the nursery after she has your t-shirts. Get them early. It's fun. Also, if you are a leader of kids, come see me after. I have a little curriculum book, and it just gives you kind of a heads up of what the kids are going to be learning, and it's good for you to know um, what, what to talk to the kids about. So come see me afterwards. Also, one more thing. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you can help at Breakaway. Exactly. Because right after service, we are going to be moving out these chairs to put in a runway for the airplanes. So... If you are here and if you could help after, just move some chairs, whirl some tables out, we would so appreciate your help. But again, thank you so much. Please be praying for the kids this week. Be praying for all of the volunteers this week. Um, it's, it's always a fun time, but it's always exhausting. So please just be praying for us. And we just can't wait. So thank you guys in advance for all that you're going to do this week. I cannot wait for next week for the recap to see what God did here. So for sure. Thank you, know, you guys. The best part of it is kids' lives will be changed for Christ yes. during this week. Yes. That is why we do what we do. Even yes. those who have accepted Christ as their Savior will grow mm -hmm. this week like never before. Mm -hmm. And some, many who have never accepted Christ in their heart as their Lord and Savior will do that this week. Yes. That's what makes it awesome. That's what it's all about. So thank yep. you, Miss Bethany. Thank you Appreciate guys so that. Much. And with that said... Yeah, okay, it's all good. Make sure you're here. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> what was that? Did you guys hear that? There is something very strange going on around here. Be here tomorrow to find out. You don't want to miss it. Kids, you may be dismissed. Let's go ahead and have the ushers come on forward for the offering. God, we just thank you this morning for what you're doing in this church, for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of your people. Father God, we just lift up Breakaway this week, that you will go before us, that you will surround us with a hedge of protection, that you will defeat the enemy in his attempts to discourage us, to diminish in any way what you want to do in us and through us this week, because we know he does not want this to happen, and he will do everything in his power to defeat us. Father God, for your protection in the name of Jesus, greater is you, you who are in us than he that is in the world. And we are so grateful for that. So we look forward with anticipation to what you're going to do this week. Excited, Father, for what you are going to do. We just lift it all up into your hands. We pray this morning as we continue in worship that we will just see you lifted up and glorified in all we do. Open our hearts and our minds for what you have for us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I didn't know that was happening, so it kind of scared me a little bit. Wow. I was like, who is on a mic? Would you stand this morning as we just continue on our worship? What an amazing thing that we have a God that can help us with our fears, can help us with our anxiety. Not saying we don't have it, not saying that we don't still get anxious about stuff, but we have a God that cares that much about us. And he can take away things that enslave us, that hold us back, because we're his children. Let's sing this next song. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I'm a 
child of God. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you were chosen. two songs are, uh, I don't know, I, I love this last, this second to last song just called Hymn of Heaven, talking about there's going to be a day when we stand before God. We're going to see those that have passed before us, those that have stood strong for our faith, some that died for our faith, some that their families shunned them for this faith, and friends. We're going to stand with them someday and worship God together. And we're going to say this was all worth it. This was true can't wait for that day. So we're going to praise him this morning as we continue in our worship. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon
as a kid, um, but just talking about praising God through everything, through all the hard times. So let's sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. And praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. And praise Father, Son, so thankful for you. God, you help us with those fears, those anxieties, the depression, the things that we struggle with all the time. God, with your arms open for each one of us because we're your children. And God, we give you praise this morning through everything, through the hard times. When we're going through something tough, God, we praise you through that. And God, give us joy through those times as well. And God, for this week coming up, it's so busy, so busy for our church. God, there's so many things that's going to try to get in the way of what you're going to do here through this camp, through almost 200 kids and over 100 volunteers. 
And God, we don't want to stand in the way of that. So God, I just pray that you would just reign through this next week, God, through this church, through the dramas and the music, through the messages, through the art and the fun. God, that these kids and these adults that volunteer would know how much you love them. God, we give you all the praise and all the glory, and we love you so much. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You, you may be dismissed to head upstairs. Speaking of youth, in case you didn't know, on Wednesday nights when our students meet here, we've been running 40 plus kids on Wednesday night. That is amazing, it's incredible, but with that said, they could use some help. If you ever thought in your heart and in your mind that maybe you could have an impact on a student at an age when this culture and our world is telling them that they don't mean a thing, that they're worthless, and there's, there's, no, there's no future for them, this is a place to do it. And I just challenge you. Um, it's amazing to work on a youth staff. Elaine and I worked on a youth staff for many years, and it's just it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding. I don't know. There's no other way to, to say it. But just encourage you in that regard, if you had ever thought of that, pray about it, think about it, and uh, see what God does in your heart. Or our kids' ministry, for that matter, same thing. So those of you who have been here know we've been doing a, a series in, in Joshua. But before we get that, I just wanted to, to start off with this. There's, the, there's a painting called The Prayer at Valley Forge. And this painting is hanging in the National Portraits Museum in Washington, D.C. And this portrait is, you probably recognize this guy. This is a portrait of George Washington. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but George Washington was a man of prayer. It's, it's recorded in diaries and history and whatnot that he would spend time in prayer, praying for the troops, praying for him, praying for the future, just, just praying. And at this moment in time when he was gathering the troops together at Valley Forge and they were getting ready to do battle with the British for the freedom of our country to, to start our fledgling nation, isn't it telling that he spent time in prayer doing that? And there was a guy by the name of Isaac Potts who owned some land around this Valley Forge area. And, and in his diary, he wrote that he was walking through the forest one day and he heard George Washington praying. And then subsequently, because of all this, this painting was done. And this painting was done fairly recently. I think it was in the 70s that this painting was done for our, our, uh, our nation's bicentennial, but still depicts the fact that George Washington was a man of prayer. Now, isn't it fitting that a man of prayer became our first president of our United States of America? One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And I think it's so awesome that our nation was founded on the premise of prayer and the, and the courage and the forethought of, the, of our forefathers who brought it all to fruition and made it all happen, along with the courage and the dedication of the people who fought in, for our nation. Similarly, Joshua and the people of Israel were learning just as George Washington showed us. Joshua and the nation of Israel, Israel were learning that prayer is huge. And if you remember going back, all the way back, and I refer back to Joshua chapter 1 frequently because there's so much, uh, so much wealth in there but in Joshua chapter 1, God gave Joshua the, success, the secret to success. He told him, if you do this, you will be successful. And in Joshua 1.8, he said, Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And whenever Joshua would do that, whenever Joshua was obedient, whenever Joshua sought the Lord for his counsel and his wisdom and his guidance, they were successful. It, he, God promised that in Joshua chapter 1, and it proved true over and over and over again. And also, on the other side of that coin, was the fact that those moments when Joshua didn't inquire of the Lord, when he lost that communication, when he, when he wasn't in good communication with God, things did not go well for them, as we found out with the story of of Achan and their defeat at the city of Ai. 
But we know that God restored them, and they got rid of the sin in the camp, and they defeated Ai. And now they have settled in, and because of their victories, Joshua brings all the people together on two mountains. And I have a little slide up there on the map of this. And at this moment in time, they put up two altars up here, and you can see you have the Mount Gerizim there, and then also Mount Ebal. And Joshua built two altars there to the Lord. And the Israelites all came together as a nation. And the Bible tells us in, at the end of Joshua chapter 8 that they worshipped God together because of the victories that he had given them. And Joshua, it says, he read the entire book of the law while they, to the nation of Israel while they were standing there. Now, if you know anything about the book of the law, it's huge. The book of the law is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's like four chapters of huge now i don't know if joshua read that whole thing but it says that joshua read the entire law both the good things and the cursed things both the good things that god said to do the cursed things that god said not to do and so joshua at this moment in time they were celebrating their victories they were celebrating god they were celebrating what god had done in them and through them and then interestingly enough Things don't go so well again. And we pick up in Joshua chapter 9, this little story here that goes like this. And there, there's a lot of scripture here, so there's a lot of slides of scripture, so just follow along with me. But I want to read it so you get the context of what's going on here in the hearts and the lives of Israel. In Joshua chapter 9, verses 1 through 14, it says, Now when all the kings of the west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of Mediterranean Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. Now that seems like it's pretty, the deck is pretty well stacked against the Israelites, doesn't it? Have you ever felt like that? Have you just felt like everything's going against you, that people, everything's just ganging up against you? That those moments in my life when I've, it's just sense that things were just closing in, piling in. I, I like to call it the piling on effect. And for you football fans, it's like, you know, you see these big old piles of football players piling on the poor guy on the bottom and you wonder how he comes out of it alive. But sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes life feels like that. And now the Israelites have celebrated God. They have celebrated by worshiping him. And now all the kings from the surrounding region have banded together and are coming together in defense of their country to defeat the Israelites. And I have another little slide up here that I wanted to throw in there just to kind of give you an idea. So you see here you got the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, all those ites were coming together. Now Joshua and, his, and the nation of Israel are kind of like right in the middle of all that. There, there, you can see the city of where it says Amorites. Right below that is the city of Ai that they have just defeated. And so this is where they have come to at this point in time. And all these nations are gathering together to fight Israel. Now, from a humanistic standpoint, you're thinking it's doomsday. There's no way the Israelites can survive this. There's no way that they're going to be able to, to fight this kind of an army that's coming together. So what happens is, and we pick it up in, in uh, verse 3, it says, However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country to make a treaty with us. Now, these Gibeonites, the city of Gibeon was just to the east of Ai. It wasn't very far away, but they put on this deception to the Israelites to make them think that they were from a faraway land and they were, they were needy and they needed help. And they were at the mercy of the Israelites because they had heard of the power of God in the life of the Israelites and what God had done at Jericho and what God had done at Ai. And they were afraid, even though they had banded together, all these other, other kingdoms were coming together against them. And so they said, we're going to trick the Israelites. 
We're going to do a ruse, and we're going to make them think that we're helpless and, and talk them into doing a treaty with us. Now, the interesting thing about that is God had told the Israelites way back in Numbers, he had told Moses, don't do this. When you take the promised land, you are to conquer the land. You are to get rid of all the other nations. You are to get rid of the sin. You are to weed it out, and this is to be the promised land for the Israelites. And the reason God did that is because he knew if he left, even if there was even a remnant of sin left anywhere in the nation, that it was going to be like an apple, a bad apple in a barrel. It was going to spread. And we see through the history of Israel that that is exactly what happened. And time and time again, you read in the Old Testament that they did, this king did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any other king before him. And then the next king comes in, and this king did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any other king before him. And there's this cycle of the Israelites going down the wrong road, being taken over by the cultures, allowing sin into the camp, and then God bringing them back in through captivity and through a number of different calamities that happened to the Israelites, bringing them back to him and reining them back in. And so what happens here? And so the Israelites said to the Hivites from Gibeon, but perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? See, Joshua, his antenna is going up here. He's wondering what in the world, this, this doesn't pass the smell test. And he said, perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? But we are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country. Because of the fame of the Lord your God, for we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan. Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but they did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by the oath. What do you think the key line of that passage of Scripture is? Anybody? They did not inquire of the Lord. Exactly. How many times do we have decisions in our life? How many times do we have things going on in our life? And it's like, we don't inquire of the Lord. It's kind of like abstract. It's like, oh, after you this have the consequences and after things have already happened, you say, gee, maybe I should have talked to the Lord about that. You think? I wonder what would have happened here if when Joshua was like, something doesn't sound here right. If he had said, God, what's going on here? Talk to me. Because Joshua seems to have had this ability to talk to God and have these conversations with God, and God would speak directly to Joshua. And I think that it had, had Joshua inquired of the Lord that they would have avoided a whole lot of trouble down the road. You see, the, these Hivites, these people from Gibeon, came and they played on the Israelites' sympathies. And they played on their pride and they played on their emotions. And I just want to throw this out to you that how does our enemy, Satan, worm his way into our hearts and into our lives? Does he not come as a wolf in sheep's clothing? Does he not come as an angel of light? Does he not come as a deceiver, as the father of lies? And how does he play into our hearts and our minds to twist the truth, to get us to a point where he can... He can get us, even in small things that we think are small, and I'm not talking about the kind of sins that we consider the big sins, but what about things of just being feeling defeated? What about things just like bitterness in our lives, things like anger issues, pride, those things that just, de just detract from our relationship with God, and how the enemy comes with ruses and makes it, sugarcoats it, and makes it look, like it's okay. Not even maybe we realize 
what he's doing in our hearts and lives, what we're allowing into our hearts and lives. Just as the Israelites at this moment in time, they did not realize what they were doing, but the key is that they did not inquire of the Lord. I mean, think about it. How many lessons do they need, right? It seems like every step of the way, they have these moments of amazingness, and then they have these moments of defeat. And God redeems them and brings them back up, and they have these amazing moments of clarity where they realize what it is that's made them successful, and then they go back. And isn't that kind of the same in a lot of respects the way our lives are? Well, we pick up the story in Joshua 9, 16 through 20, 24, and it says, Three days after they made this treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors. Oh, they just found out. Excuse me, what? We've been deceived. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day they came to their city, Gibeon, Kithira, Beeroth, and Kiriam Jerim. Don't ask me if I said those right, it's close enough. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, at least they didn't make two wrongs make a right, because had they attacked them, they would have gone against the oath that they had made in the eyes of God. And now we would have two wrongs, but at least they followed through on their oath that they would not attack and they would not defeat the Gibeonites. Then the five kings, oh, don't, don't get ahead of myself here. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmoth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. And now I've really gotten ahead of myself. I'm sorry, whoever's running the slides today, I'm all over the place. I apologize. Stay with me. We'll get there. So what happened is, because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath, this is in chapter 9, verses 16 through 24, because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord of God of Israel, the whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, we had given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them, and this is really key in this story. We will let them live so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leaders promised them, promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you while actually you live near us? You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. See, what basically what they did is they made them slaves. They made them their servants forever because of this treaty that they had made. And they answered Joshua and said, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all the inhabitants from before you. That's found in Numbers 33, verses 50 and 56, for those of you who like to go back and, and look at this stuff. You will never be... Re then they answered Joshua. Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servants Mo servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and whatever seems right to you. Look at the way they were deceived. They were deceived because they let their guard down. They were deceived because they had come, come, become complacent in their victory. They had just had this massive mountaintop experience praising God, and now they had let their guard down. And oftentimes I think that's with us. You know, sometimes just life is good, isn't it? And for a lot of us, I think we just, you know, every day is good, and, and we're in a good place, and... God is good to us, and it, isn't it true that at moments like that, when we let our guard down and we become a little bit complacent, that Satan has his best ability to worm his way into our hearts and into our lives and pervert the truth and just be, let us become complacent? That's when the attacks can become huge. They were deceived because they had let their guard down. They became complacent with their victories. 
They had forgotten the commands that the Lord God had given them and they had disobeyed, neglecting to seek God's counsel. They did not inquire of the Lord. Big mistake. Huge, big mistake for the people of Israel. They did not inquire of the Lord. And because of this treaty that they made, now, you don't think for a minute that this, these cultures that they made woodcutters, it sounds all, okay, it's all cool, we made them servants and we made them slaves, but I can guarantee you that those cultures that the Israelites allowed in to become their woodcutters and their water carriers and their slaves, their religions and their gods and their culture was going to begin to seep into the hearts and lives of the people of Israel, whether they recognized it or not, whether they wanted it or not. And from this moment on in time, we begin to see this constant cycle of the Israelites being inundated and immersed in the cultures of the people around them because they did not do what God had told them to do right from the very beginning big mistake that's how they were deceived because they had let their guard down and our challenge for us this morning is we cannot let our guard down for a minute even when life is good sometimes i think when 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 life gets tough that's when we fall on our knees and say help me out of this god help me out of this situation but when life is good we just neglect him we it's it's like we don't need god because it's all good you know, life is good. There's no issues going on. I don't know. Maybe that's, it seems like there's always some kind of issue going on in life, right? But at this moment in time, the Israelites had made a big mistake by letting their guard down and by becoming complacent in their victories. So though that was the deception. The Israelites were deceived by the people of Gibeon. There's a distraction in all of this, and we see that in Joshua 9, 26 to 27. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day, he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose, and that is what they are to this day. That is what they are to this day. You see, it all sounds so good. He made them the attendees, the attenders to the altar of the Lord. But that's not what God had told them to do. That was in direct disobedience to what God's commands to Moses had been. And then it says, but the Lord was still fighting for, for Israel. The distraction was the influence of foreign cultures, beliefs, customs, and religions. And it became the bane of the Israelites' existence, all because they forgot, neglected to inquire of the Lord. But there's good news in all this. The good news is, is that once again, in God's grace and in his mercy, there was deliverance. And in Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, this whole battle thing continues. The, the nations had still banded against Israel. And it says, Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king. And that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city. Like one of the royal cities, it was larger than I, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Hiram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because they have made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. The deck is stacked again. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. And remember that map that I showed you. All those kingdoms that were surrounding the Israelites, and they all start coming together and they all start focusing in and they become like a pincher movement surrounding the people of Israel and, and Gibeon who had made the treaty with Jerusalem. The, Gibeons, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. Another key phrase in this whole passage, 
the Lord said to Joshua. Apparently, Joshua has reestablished his communication with God at this point. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. Can you imagine this? I mean, I know I've never been, I've never experienced this before, but I understand like in the Midwest, there's hail stones that are like the size of softballs and they do massive damage to cars. Could you imagine getting hit in the head with one of those? It could do some significant damage. And this is the picture that I get here. But once again, God is telling the Israelites, this battle is mine, it is not yours. Because with me, with God, you can do anything. When I tell you what to do and you do it and you're obedient, you cannot be defeated. Story continues. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. See, what happened was, is Joshua is pursuing the enemy, but he was running out of daylight. And he knew that if the daylight if daylight ended and it got dark that a lot of these a lot of the enemy was going to escape and disperse and may even come back to fight again and so joshua prayed he says god make the sun stand still and the moon stand still over the valley of ajalon so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its en enemies as, as it is written in the book of jashar the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Interestingly enough, there's been some studies done, and they're a little controversial, but there have been guys who have gone back, scientists who have gone back in computers and researched this time, and they have found missing time a full day missing in the data in the computers that go back. Now, I'm not a scientist, and, and I, you know, I couldn't tell you how accurate that is, but I have read that, that they have actually gone back and found missing day, a missing day of data in the computer modules of going back in time. It is certainly not outside the realm of possibility that that, could, that would happen, right? I mean, it says that the sun stood still for a full day, a 24-hour period. And it just shows us God's power over his creation, even time. It shows his power over the sun, the moon. It shows his power over the, the days of the week, the minutes, the hours of the day, the minutes and days and hours that you and I every day spend in our life, doing whatever it is that we're doing at any particular time. But God has control over that. And if we let him, if we let God take control over that in our hearts and lives, he will conquer and he will go before us and he will show us every step of the way what it is that he wants us to do and how he wants us to live our lives. You see, when the Israelites, when Joshua returned back to God, when they returned back to their to their relationship with God, and Joshua began to seek God for guidance. Here we go again. Another awesome cycle of God's redemption, his restoration, his grace, and his mercy, just as he does with us. Once again, Joshua turned to God, and once again, they were obedient to God's plan, and once again, they were miraculously delivered by the Lord. You see, there's always forgiveness. There's always redemption. There's always restoration for us at the foot of the cross. At God's right hand, there's always, no matter what we've done, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter how bad we've blown it, there is always forgiveness and restoration at the foot of the cross. Always, that's a promise. Jesus himself addressed this with his disciples. He was teaching in Jerusalem, and there was not only his disciples, but there was a large crowd of Pharisees and, and peoples from different walks of life listening to him, and, and Jesus was explaining to them 
how Satan worms his way into our hearts and lives so subtle. And he actually called the people that he was talking to, he called them, he told them that their father was the devil because they had not yet come to the realization of who Jesus was, that he was the son of the living God. And in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is talking to them and he says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is a master of deception. He is a master of deceit. He is a master of twisting the truth and sugarcoating it as the father of lies. And the minute we give in to any kind of temptation, the minute we give in to any kind of defeat, the minute we give in to any kind of discouragement, we are playing right into his hands. And the minute we become complacent, and the minute, minute we become thinking, man, life is good, I got, I got this. No, yeah, you, you may have it for a moment, but until we recognize that it's God who has us and not ourselves, that we open ourselves up to the attacks of the enemy, the father of lies. Is it any wonder that we give in to temptation so easily? There was a song in 1977, and I look out, and I know a lot of you have heard this song. It was a song by Debbie Boone. And there's a line in there that says, it can't be wrong when it feels so right. Isn't that what our culture teaches us today? This world that we're sub submersed in, that we live in, that we're such a part of, that's exactly what this, our culture is teaching us. It can't be wrong when it feels so right. If it feels good, do it. Just leave each other. Be individuals. Just let live and let live. Live and let live. It can't be wrong when it feels so right. You see, that's the lie that Satan wants to give us. That's the lie that he wants to tell you and I. Is it any wonder that we often feel defeated, beat up, demoralized because of Satan's efforts? You see, because if he can do that, if he can get us to feel defeated, if he can get us to be demoralized, if he can get us to, to just feel like insignificant, in the grand scheme of things, then he's won. We cannot give up a moment of our being on guard against the attacks of the enemy. We have to stay in constant communication with our creator for his protection and for his guidance and for his mercy. See, his attacks are often intensified coming on the heels of a victory. And I've seen that happen. You have this big mountaintop experience, and then the next thing you know, something happens to just bring you crashing right back down into the valley again. And you say, what happened? Did God desert me? No, God did not desert you. God is with you every step of the way, and sometimes he has to bring us into those valleys and through those valleys to get us to the point where he wants us to be. And so my encouragement to you this morning and my challenge to you this morning is don't let your guard down for a minute. No matter how good life is, no matter how bad life is, don't let your guard down for a minute because that's when Satan will worm his way in just like the Gibeonites did with the people of Israel. He will twist the truth just enough to get us to compromise, to be distracted, to be complacent, to compromise our values. I just want to finish with this little passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians this morning because it's such an encouragement to me, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you as well. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 9, he says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth, Plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Don't let the God of this age blind us to the glory of God who rules in our hearts and lives. 
Paul goes on, he says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made the light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yeah, but not crushed. Perplexed, yeah, but not abandoned, but not in despair. Persecuted, yes, but not abandoned. Struck down, sometimes, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet in, inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. You see, God wins. Every time, God wins. What side are you on? The battle is the Lord's, and he wins every time. Why would we go anywhere else? Why would we want to go anywhere else? And yet the subtlety of the enemy distracts our attention any way he can. I don't know where you're at this morning in your life. Maybe life is good. Don't let your guard down. Not for a minute, because that's when he hits you the hardest. And maybe you're struggling this morning. Maybe you're here because of something going on in your life that is just, it's just hard. Life is hard sometimes. Don't give in to despair, because the battle is the Lord's. God's battle. He will not defeated, be defeated. God wins every time if you allow him to be the ruler of your heart. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you this morning for this lesson from the, from the people of Israelites, from Joshua. Father God, we see how they let their guard down and they were destined for failure. Father God, I pray this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds to see those areas where we need to guard our hearts those areas where we need to build up our, our defenses through your strength and through your power. Father God, I pray this morning that every one of us will just look to you for our source of power and that we will let you fight the battles for us because you've already done that. You've already been the victor. You've already defeated them. You've already fought them for us. Why would we go anywhere else? So I pray this morning that you would challenge us in that regard. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So we'll have some of the prayer team up here this morning. I'll stay up here for a few minutes. Um, if you can, stick around and help clear out chairs. We're going to set up some round tables and just get ready for the big debut tomorrow night. Hope you're going to be part of it. God bless. Have a great week. Keep us in prayer. Even if you're not helping, pray, pray, pray over breakaway and over what God's going to do this week. So God bless. Have a great week. And we'll talk next Saturday about the victories that we see of what God does throughout the week.